Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. How's everybody doing? It's me, Legal Vices, and I am here, and it is another Monday. So uh, before we start, I I got a question here for y'all. Um, it's just a total random housekeeping question. Uh, so I will... I will throw up this question here in a poll. Uh, I've just changed the microphone position off to the side instead of right here in front of me. Uh, just going to ask a quick poll here. Uh, mic position, new or old? <laughs> new, old. All right. The poll is up. Uh, just to answer the quick poll. I, the, the reason I moved it was because I talk with my hands a lot and I notice I've been hitting the microphone a lot while, while I talk and it gets in the way of typing things if uh, if I have to type something. So I don't know how this affects the sound quality. Um, so I mean if, if, it, if there's a noticeable decline in the uh, in the microphone sound quality, then let me know and we'll go go back to where it uh, where it belongs. <laughs> So it's up to you. Just uh, I'm just curious to whether there's a, a noticeable difference in the uh, in the sound quality. So all right. Well, everybody says it sounds fine. So maybe we'll just keep it here. It's just weird now. I have it out of my peripheral vision. Uh, all right. Okay. Well, all right. Got that major crises out of the way here. Um, Flux starting us off with a super chat. Like the new mic placement. Hashtag Panzer Prison. And ladies and gentlemen, I have to confess, I'm wearing pants. It's just got uh, it's just got too too chilly here at night. Uh, I could close the window and that would maybe warm it up a bit more, but I think pants season, winter pants season, is upon us. Granted, they're pants that I would never be caught dead in uh, showing in public, so you will never see them. But <laughs> they're 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 sky blue. And they have uh, little multiple colored hearts and kittens on. <laughs> hey, they're soft and fuzzy, and they were five dollars at the local market. Uh, <laughs> and so, all right. <clears throat> Ooh, knuckles cracking. So here, we, here we are. We've got through the weekend. Nick is back, as we all know. Uh, we got through my uh, Friday thing. Uh, <laughs> we survived everything we had to survive. Uh, that was great. That was, that was totally awesome. Um, it appears that it also inadvertently started some drama again. Uh, <laughs> but who cares? Uh, we, we had our, 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 our drama dose, our law tube drama dose this weekend. Uh, and Steph, the Alter Nerd, had a birthday celebration yesterday that was well attended by internet peeps. Um, Drex, if you caught his stream today, Drex was on fire. Uh, yeah, I would I would recommend people go check out Drex's stream. But with that, oh, it's weird having all this brand new space here. <laughs> I can move my hands about freely. Uh Oh, and people are just asking what drama. Just those who support Nick and those who did not support Nick and those who were wishy-washy in their support for Nick. And it's kind of drawn along the lines that we just naturally assumed it would be drawn along. Um, you can go get your dose from anywhere on LawTube Twitter or LawTube. Specifically, you can go see the, you can go see Drex uh, at MGTOWN Podcast or Legal Mindset. Uh they're they're the ones that are that are most clear on the on on who who stands with whom and where and why. Um, ultimately, it doesn't matter because people will always have their positions, and you know you stand with friends or you don't. That's it. They're your friends. You stand with them, and in public, and then in private, if they're lying to you, you beat their ass. Uh, but I'll, I'll always stick with your friends in public. Uh, bad weather biker, at least you're not the dummy who wore upside down pineapples. Stop talking about the goddamn pineapples on my shirt. <laughs> there, there's only four pineapples on that entire pineapple shirt that are actually upside down. <laughs> Shut up. Uh, yeah, watch some law nerd clips. Well, if, if you're not a big fan of directs, watch Legal Mindset, watch Law Nerd clips, watch pretty much anybody's clips uh, from LawTube over the weekend, and you'll you'll get your daily dose of of drama. <clears throat> Mimi knows Korea has the best fuzzy pants. 
Absolutely. I'm a 53-year-old international lawyer, and I love my sky blue heart and kitty pattern fuzzy pants. <laughs> don't knock them. Don't laugh them until you've tried them. Um, yeah. I'm telling you, they're, they're comfortable. Or you can just go to Definitely Not Brandon, who will tell you legal bites and hug from, from the windows to the wall. Uh, yeah. Or you can just go to, to Definitely Not Brandon. He'll he'll tell you how it is. Uh, all right. Today is, is Maritime Monday. Um, we don't want to we don't want to get uh, too far off of off track, but I want to thank everybody who has subscribed over the past uh, couple of weeks. Again, we were supposed to have the 25,000 subscriber stream last Friday. We ended up having a 26,000 two or 300 something subscriber party. But today we're just shy of 26,500 subscribers. So thanks to everybody that's continued to subscribe, subscribe and support the channel. It's deeply appreciated. Um, yeah, we're going to have to retire the 25,000 uh, subscriber emoticon because we passed that a long time ago. Uh, hey, everybody that's here, we're already up to 206 viewers and only 89 likes. So that's like one third of you have done their job. Two thirds of you haven't done your job. Get down there, hit that like button. It takes that long and it lets YouTube know that we're here and puts us out on YouTube's radar. We, we're starting to come up a lot in people's recommendations on the front screen, as well as at the end of the video cards, watch this next. So the hitting the likes and hitting the subscriber button is doing a lot. Hit that notification as well. We have three tiers of membership if you want to join, absolutely not required, but uh, hey, it's there if you want to take advantage of it. Uh, we're, we're not going to talk much about the Super Chats today. Just the Super Chats are there. I try to pay attention to the stream, uh, but you know, you can't get, catch all of them. But I will catch and read and answer and address every single Super Chat that's made. No minimum required. It's not required to participate. It just guarantees participation. All right, with that out of the way, we're gonna, it's going to be kind of a short show today, I think, because this is a, this is a very old case. It's a... It's not really an accident, uh, but it is something that happened on the ocean, and it's just fascinating to watch. And, uh, of course, the dogs are deathly quiet until I start streaming, and now they're snoring on the sofa behind me here. Can we see? Are they on the sofa? Where are they? Okay. Oh, that's why it was so loud. Darky's right behind the chair. I just about ran over her. All right. <clears throat> so any any heavy breathing, snoring? or slobbery type noises you hear are coming from the dog and not me. <laughs> so, okay. Monday with bison hat. This is, this, this is my Polish fisherman captain's hat made from Sterkowski, the maker of Polish, of Polish fisherman captain hat people. Uh, yeah. We're talking about eating people today because why not? <laughs> That's the subject for today. Cannibalism. Did you know that cannibalism happens a bit? I don't, I'm sure, I mean, I mean, not, not, I'm sure it happens a lot less now than it did way back in the day, but back in the uh, 17, 1800s, it was, it was not unheard of. Uh, lots of uh, accidents and it was, they were sailing ships. So you can't just power through any, you get caught in the doldrums or things like that. Uh, you're, you're stranded for a long period of time. With minimal stores uh, to to you know to support you, Amanda H. Congratulations to you for being awesome. You are our newest member at the clean and sober level. Congratulations! <laughs> Stop blaming the dogs. Uh, no, it's uh, it's the dogs. I I, I just I, I snore when I'm asleep. Uh, I could be asleep by the end of this. I'm pretty damn tired actually. Um, but what we're looking at here is is cannibalism on the high seas. That's today's subject. Uh, why are we talking about this? Because it's a really cool case. That's why. Um, now, obviously cannibalism isn't really looked upon highly. It's not looked, it's not looked upon favorably in Western culture. Uh, other cultures may do it, practice it regularly. I don't know how many cannibal tribes there are still out there in the world, but uh, some people still do it. 
But cannibalism has actually played a role in human civilization for thousands of years, from ancient you know, tribes in South America uh, to basically what we're going to be talking about today, disaster survival techniques. Uh, we, I don't know if you've seen the movie Alive or read the book uh, about the, uh, the soccer team that crashed in the Andes. Uh, you know, that was a, that was a very, very famous case where you sort of had to take a nibble or two to, to make sure you survived. And I mean, of course we would all say, oh no, I would never do that. You know, I, 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 I would never, never, I would never eat another human being, but wait till uh, you have the opportunity and you're starving to death. And, uh, I, I would imagine it's not a decision that's made lightly, but when it comes down to death or doing that, you know, it, uh, it might be something you would do to, to survive. Now, what we're going to be talking about tonight is the Mignonette. The Mignonette is, is a, a yacht. It's one of the famous cases of cannibalism at sea. Uh, it was a 52-foot yacht that was bought by a lawyer in Australia. He wanted just for leisure purposes and to, to show off to his friends. Uh, but uh, he needed it sailed from Southampton to Sydney. It's about 13,000 miles. <laughs> he, he wanted to get it there. Uh, and he wanted to have, uh, here's again, here, here's where we get into problems on the high sea. Uh, yes. Long pork. That was the, uh, long pork was the, uh, the euphemism for, for human flesh in the, uh, in the, in the Navy shipping industry back, back in the day. Ugh. But anywho, uh, so he wanted this, he wanted this ship just to show off to his friends. He had to sail it and where he started to go wrong, perhaps was it was a, it's not really an ocean going size of ship back then. Uh, but he wanted to get it shipped to him from Southampton to Sydney cheaply by sailing it there. <laughs> so he gets a crew, a very young crew. I think the, the captain, uh, the captain was 30 or 31 years old, uh, depending on the different stories. Um, there was a guy named Tom Dudley was the captain, Edwin Stevens, Edmund Brooks, and Richard Parker, the 17-year-old cabin boy. Um, don't don't want to talk, I'll, don't want to give away too many of the spoilers for this case. <laughs> so, of, of course, the lawyer is the cannibal. The lawyer wasn't the cannibal. The lawyer just bought the ship. <laughs> <laughs> the cannibals happened later. Uh, and, I mean, interestingly enough, cannibalism wasn't really prohibited by law. Um, as a survival thing, it was custom. You know, the, the, the custom of the sea uh, for, for an incredibly long period of time was that you could commit cannibalism if it was necessary to survive. Uh, but this case actually set a precedent. This case set a precedent for the fact that cannibalism is okay, but murdering someone to eat them is not okay. If Jeffrey Dahmer had just waited for victims to die naturally and ate them, uh, and if he was on the ocean and a long time ago, uh, he could have had a game. But no, that, that was basically it. People just realized that sometimes you just had to do dirty stuff like that to survive. Uh, so that wasn't a crime. The this, this case sort of set the precedent for, is it okay to murder someone to eat them? Or you just have to wait until they die of other causes before you can eat them. <laughs> uh, so that, that, that's the big question that was here answered legally. And uh, we're going to watch two videos, one kind of medium length, one sort of short. Uh, the longer one talks a little bit about, well, they both talk a little bit about the judgment, but from slightly different perspectives. But there's, there's one interesting thing about this. It's very, very fat. It's, I mean, it's creepy fascinating to me uh, because I love Edgar Allan Poe's books. I, I'm a huge fan of Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, they're, they're like my, my two favorite classical writers would be Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft. Both horror writers. I love, I love their style. But there's a short story that was written by Edgar Allan Poe in 1838. Which, 
you know how we say that the Simpsons, uh, the, you know, the, the Simpsons predict the future occasionally. Edgar Allan Poe wrote a short story in 1883. And remember, we said that the cabin boy in this case, his name was Richard Parker. He was a 17 year old Richard Parker. Keep the name Richard Parker in your head because this story that was written in 1838, decades, decades before this uh, Mignonette case, probably decades before the Mignonette was, was, was built. He, Edgar Allan Poe wrote a short story where a character named Richard Parker, the same as the cabin boy who we're going to talk about his demise in a minute, Yep, the it, and Barney Yellum is talking about it right here. Where'd you go, Barney? Barney, had to scroll down here and bring you up. Yes, legal advice. Edgar Allan Poe, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket, great cannibalism sea story in it. That's what we're talking about. Richard Parker is this is the character in the story. He has the same name as the seventeen year old cabin boy that was murdered and eaten on the Minionette. Uh, but what happens to the Richard Parker in the short story here by Richard by, by Edgar Allan Poe is Richard Parker was eaten by fellow sailors after hunger sat in. Sat in, I guess. So that's that's how cool that story is. Edgar Allan Poe wrote a story decades before this happened where he got the name of the dude that was going to be eaten correctly. The, the, the P, Richard Parker. He got the name right. He got how he how he and why he was eaten correctly. That's wild. I, I just find that that is a, a creepy level of coincidence. Not that Poe wrote a story about sailors that are stranded. Not that Poe wrote a, a story about sailors that are stranded and had to re resort to cannibalism. He wrote a story about a ship that and crew that got stranded. They got hungry and they killed and ate a dude named Richard Parker, which is exactly what happened decades later in this case we're going to look at right now. So yeah, this is this is a wild, wild story. And we're going to jump right into it. And while I'm doing that, we got 300 current viewers here and 175 likes while I'm bringing this video up. Please hit that like button. You can never not make me happy enough by hitting that like button. Um, all righty. And uh, subscribe if you haven't already done so. Super chats, do your thing. And here we go. This is from a new website called Brief Case. Uh, it's a great, they, he, he only has about 10 or so videos up, I believe. Um, no, he's got, he's got a little bit more than this, but this is a great little case where they, the site where there's a kind of a big collection of weird cases like this. Uh, so go check out Briefcase. Oh, wait a minute. Ha! Huh. See, Fedorovsky says, naturally marinated in port wine. Mmm, I just happen to have a glass of Graham's 10-year tawny port wine right here. Mmm. So there we go. Let's hit the start button on this and let's watch this together. Again, this is not a big maritime collision that we're going to have to work out and talk about the details of who did what wrong and why this thing happened. We pretty much know everything. It's just a weird story that I wanted to share with you. And we can walk and we'll have to talk and pause a little bit together just to bring out some details. Uh, so go ahead. Let's watch it. Today we are looking at a case from the second part of the 19th century. So sit back as we go to the South Atlantic Ocean. In 1883, an Australian barrister and politician named John Want came to England as he wanted to buy a yacht. He had already established a large law practice in Sydney and was known to invest in commercial ventures, many of which turned out to be extremely profitable he was a keen yachtsman, and in 1862, his father had been a founding member of the Royal Sydney Yacht Squadron. Mr. Want travelled to the town of Cowes on the Isle of Wight, where he was shown a number of yachts, but there was one that caught his eye. This was a yacht called the Minionette. It had been built 16 years earlier in 1867 and was 52 feet long. Even though the vessel was not designed for long voyages, it was still a sturdy boat and Mr. Want decided to purchase it. 
However, the only way he could get the mignonette to Australia was by sailing it there. This would not be an easy voyage. Yeah, so there, there we go. That's what we were just talking about. It wasn't built for long voyages from England to Australia. Uh, but lawyer wants it, and he wants it cheap, so he's going to try to do it. And uh, cue bad things happening. As despite its length of 52 feet, the boat was considered small for such a journey, and the prospect of sailing 15,000 miles to Australia was not something that very many people who Mr. Want approached would consider. However, he persevered and eventually <laughs> found a crew willing to sail the Minionette to Australia. His captain was a 30-year-old gentleman named Mr. Thomas Dudley. Surprisingly, he seemed quite keen to undertake the voyage, and it transpired. That's a pretty old-looking 30-year-old. That he had been considering emigrating to Australia for some time. The first mate was Mr. Edwin Stevens. He was 37 years old and a very experienced sailor, having first taken to the high seas at the age of 14. The other crew members were 39-year-old Edmund Brooks and a 17-year-old orphan boy who had very little sailing experience named Richard Parker. First mate Edwin Stevens had previously sailed with Thomas Dudley and the two got on well. On the 19th of May, 1884, the four-man crew set sail from the English port of Southampton bound for Sydney. For the first six weeks, the voyage was rather uneventful. The sun had been shining on most days and the seas were relatively calm. However, as they sailed south on their route towards... So was that a steamship? No, it was a, it was a sailboat. It was a sailing ship. Uh. It was the Cape of Good Hope. They encountered a storm that was accompanied by extremely strong winds. It was now the 5th of July. And although the yacht seemed my birthday, another tie to the story to be coping surprisingly well in the conditions, Captain Dudley instructed the crew to heave to. This was a way of slowing the boat's forward progress as well as fixing the helm and sail positions. He did this so that the boat could continue without being steered, enabling the crew time to rest. However, just as this was done, and Richard Parker had been sent below to prepare food. A very large wave broke over the yachts, which washed away the bulk walks, and the mignonette was pushed onto its side. Captain Thomas Dudley could see that the yacht was in a lot of trouble and quickly told Edwin Stevens that they must lower the one lifeboat they had. No sooner had the lifeboat touched the water than the four crew members climbed on board, having grabbed what little provisions they could. As they turned and looked back, they watched the mignonette, the yacht that had been their home for the previous six weeks, sink out of sight on its way to the bottom of the ocean. The lifeboat was not particularly sturdy. Now, okay, you said I was coming in a bit hot, so <clears throat> I have pulled the pulled the uh, the mic down just a bit. Uh, legal advisor, could you do one on the Salem witches? Um, Scott. Internet historian guy is going to be doing something on the Salem witches very, very soon. He's the one I'd send there because he's actually researching it. <laughs> I just talk about shit. Um, but yeah, so here we got the, uh, we got these guys. They've just got off their ship and minutes after they abandon the ship, it sinks. There's nothing left. It's just them in their boat. And he talked about their provisions. They managed to get what food they could before jumping into the lifeboat. And it wasn't a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the dog snoring probably does get picked up because it's, it's pointed more in their direction rather than, than up and away from them. Uh, I'll just have to keep them out of the room. So, all right, let's get back to these guys and learn what they had to eat for the uh, brief period of time they had it to eat. The boards were only six millimeters thick and it had not been built to withstand the weather conditions in the Atlantic Ocean. Fortunately, before boarding the lifeboat, Captain Dudley had the presence of mind to get the compass from the deck, as well as the sextant and chronometer. Their position seemed quite perilous in a flimsy lifeboat adrift in the Atlantic Ocean with the nearest land, the small island of St. Helena some 700 miles away. The four men looked to what they'd been able to salvage from the yachts, and when everything was put in the middle of the lifeboats, they all suddenly realised the seriousness of their situation. Mm. 
all they had were two tins of turnips and no fresh water. Captain Dudley was an experienced sailor. He managed to use... So how's that? That's what they had. A couple of cans of turnips and some water. Yeah. Not looking good. Uh, They're somewhere in the middle of the South Pacific. Or South Atlantic, I guess. Or South Pacific. I don't know where the hell they were. (laughs) They're out in the middle of the ocean. I don't know the exact location where this went down what little he had to make a sea anchor this was designed okay and what a sea anchor does hey we can talk about something maritime a sea anchor isn't like an anchor that you drop to the bottom of the ocean to keep you from moving anywhere a a sea anchor's job is to slow you down or try to keep you 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 on a straight slow course um it's a sit it's essentially like if you dropped a parachute in the water. It just collects water and sort of weighs you down and keeps you slow. Uh, that's the best way I can describe. Like the purpose of a sea anchor would be like if you if you threw away an anchor, like you know, like a, a parachute in the water to try to slow it down and drag the vessel. Ozzy Overlord. All right, gents, whose blood are we drinking first? <laughs> well, there's only one lucky guy in this in or unlucky guy in this position. Uh. Yeah, and again, it's it's the Australians, as as our our Maud Allen said, you know, WTF Australia, and he can say that as an Australian. Uh, so let's hear about how he created this sea anchor, which like is normally made out of like a net or a cloth or something. To stabilize the lifeboat and, and no fresh water, Captain Dudley was an experienced sailor. He managed to use what little he had to make a sea anchor. This was designed to stabilize the lifeboats which was very important when the winds were blowing and the seas were rough. He planned to travel west. He knew that by doing this, they would cross the commercial shipping lanes and it would be their best chance of getting spotted and then picked up. However, it did take a number of days before the crew would agree to give him fabric from their clothes so he could make an improvised sail. If any of them were in any doubt about the severity of their plight, they soon realised when before any of them slept on the first night in the lifeboat, they had to fend off a shark with their oars. For the first two days, none of the men ate anything. They hoped that the sea may provide for them, but they had no means by which to catch any fish, and it had barely rained, so they were unable to drink very much water. On the 7th of July, Mm. Captain Dudley opened the first tin of turnips, and he shared them equally amongst the crew, a meagre ration, and they now only had one tin left. The empty turnip tin would now serve to catch rainwater if it ever rained. Two days later, a turtle was spotted, which Edwin Stevens managed to catch and bring on board. See, Farron, see, Farron, if you ever watch this, there are turtles out in the sea. There are sea turtles. If you were there for our our unexplained (laughs) cast with Farron Balance a couple of weeks ago talking about the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. In my my drunken idiocy, uh, I, I was there. there she, she was talking about the the shuttle uh, command module crashing into the ocean, and I mentioned what about the sea turtles? And she called me a fucking idiot about because there's sea turtles in the ocean. There's one right here. They caught it. This, along with the second tin of turnips, kept the crew fed for the next seven days. Casey says However, Australia is not real. To drink the turtles' blood. <laughs> As although Captain Dudley had tried to catch the blood in his pyrometer case. The winds that day were quite strong, and as the waves broke over the side of the lifeboats, the blood became mixed with seawater. As the sun beat down on them, and they could see no signs of rain, the men eventually started to drink their own urine. Their lips became parched, and the exposure to the sun, sea, and wind... Yeah, drinking your own urine only gets you so far. I mean, that's your ultimate emergency water supply for about a day uh then you just lose any benefit uh i i mean that's that's where drinking your own urine falls on the scale of desperation it's below drinking the blood of sea turtles and apparently above eating humans so where where does it fit on the grotesque scale drinking your own urine is squarely between eating human bodies and drinking sea turtle blood 
Uh, but they didn't even get to drink the sea turtle blood because the wind was blowing it everywhere and it was getting mixed with water. And uh, there you go. Wind meant that their skin became sore. In desperation, young Richard Parker drank seawater and became quite ill, as did Edwin Stevens. Yeah, don't drink seawater. Yeah, don't do not do not drink seawater. Uh, you will get dehydrated. It is way saltier than you think. It will lead to dehydration, muscle cramps, hallucinations, and then a horrible, painful death. Uh, and again, Casey, uh, I, I know I mentioned it, but I want to get it again louder when we're on pause. Thank you so much for the super chat. Australia is not real, as confirmed by the people who definitely do not live in Australia. Aussie Law, Alan, and others. It is a non-existent fictional place created probably by Terry Pratchett. Their situation had become so serious that after four days without food, Captain Dudley raised a question as to whether one of them should be sacrificed in order to save the other three since boarding the... Okay, now, here's here's the thing. Here's where, where I have the question. How long would it take you to start contemplating eating a human body? Not just eating a human body, but literally sacrificing a living human being to eat their flesh. How long would it take you? I would like to think that it would take longer than four days. I would like to think I can go four days without food. Uh, but I mean, water is the biggest problem. You know, liquid, you, you need some water. You know, blood is salty. Urine is salty. The seawater is too salty. <laughs> Peter Watkins, <laughs> Peter Watkins is 45 minutes. <laughs> I think, I think that may be a, maybe a little too soon. <laughs> Spooky spoon, maybe a second. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, you need the water. I mean, water is going to kill you before lack of food kills you a long time before. Um, I would like to think they could have like bled themselves or something, or I don't, I don't know, but I, I would be more concerned about water. Um, and how to, how to, how to get water. But say, ah, I'm hungry. I'm, I haven't eaten much for four days ex except for a couple of turnips. Let's uh, let's sacrifice somebody. Yeah. Entry required. Thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, at Casey, listen to Legal Vices and Aussie Overlord. Of course, Australia is real. If it were not, the rest of the Western world would be flooded with mental patients and psycho killers. <laughs> Uh, but we could have claimed Chopper Reed for our own. Uh, all right, let's get let's get back to these guys. That took them four days to figure, just to go. Um, who's gonna die? I mean, I would like. I mean, I'm fat, so I need a lot of food. Uh, I would like to think that I could at least. I mean, that that's the joy of being fat. I'm gonna be one of the last ones to die of hunger. <laughs> So yay for me, but I would like to think that, uh, I would at least be able to last until someone else died. Like, okay, he's dead. Now we can feast upon his flesh. Not let's make someone dead so we can feast upon their flesh. Ozzy Overlord said he's a bit wrong. Nope. He's not wrong. <laughs> Jason McConnell. Thank you so much for the super chat. First, Poe. Second, the boat was literally named after a seafood sauce. Oh, it is too. Mignonette is a, is a seafood sauce. How much foreshadowing did this crew need? <laughs> Especially poor young Richard Parker, who apparently was illiterate. <laughs> That's a nice one. The boat was literally named after a seafood sauce. You, you, you are not wrong. <laughs> That was, that was pretty good. Thank you. Uh, entry required asks, have you been out on the heavy seas? I have not. My dad saw propellers more than once. I have been, uh, I mean, you know, several miles out to sea. I've never been like on the high seas in the middle of a typhoon, but I, I've, I've seen 
15, 20 foot waves. There were way more than I wanted to think. Of. I mean, when you're out there in the sea in the big storms, you can get 50, 60, 70, 80 foot waves. Just, I mean, insane. Uh, and Jason McConnell. Okay. We got you. I, that that's the post of the day so far. I, I like that one. And baloney, baloney bong. And again, if, if you saw the, uh, if you saw the, the, uh, Brooks trial jury instruction thing that, w- that I, I uploaded, it got, it got copyright struck because of an of A and E stupid self sovereign citizen video that I included. So I had to re-upload it. Uh, there's a big section for like 20 minutes. We were arguing about whether it's pronounced baloney or Bologna, all because of baloney bong here. $5 super chat. Thank you so much. The human body is approximately 60% water. Two birds stoned at once. Well, that's, uh, that's what they're going to do. I mean, that's the idea that, that you drink the blood and eat the meat. Mmm, tasty. Uh, <laughs> All right, two more super chats, and we'll dive back into this. When you're dehydrated, your blood can be too thick for a stock to draw. Yuck, like curdled milk to drink. Pro- yeah, I, I, that's. I wonder how. I wonder how dehydrated you have to be for your blood to start to thicken. Oh, we talk about such interesting things <laughs> on this channel. Uh, Casey, Australia lost a war against emus. Well, they've also historically lost wars against mice. Uh, and rabbits, <laughs> mice, rabbits, and emus. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, my Australian people. I love you, but yeah, you have a rodent problem. <laughs> it's not funny, really. If if you go watch the videos about some of the some of the rodent problems, I mean, it's pretty freaking amazing. Uh, well, let's get back to the, these guys. Don't have a rodent problem. If they had a rodent problem on their and remi- and remember that the wood in this lifeboat is six millimeters thick. That's like a quarter of an inch thick. And frogs, yeah, they had a, they had a frog war. Um, but yeah, so if these people would have had a rodent problem, they wouldn't have had to worry about eating each other after only four days. Uh, so how did they resolve the situation? Let's find out. In the lifeboat on the 5th of July, they had not seen any ships, not even a lone vessel on the distant horizon. Captain Dudley said that they would decide on who should die by drawing lots. However, this suggestion caused some disagreement between the men. And in case you didn't know, drawing lots is essentially like drawing straws. You know, where the the shortest straw is is the loser. Uh, so that's where it's basically the four of them. They just, they drew straws to see who was, oh, and cockroach. Every, everybody has lost a war to cockroaches. The, nuclear bombs can't take those out. So what are we going to do? Uh, but yeah, so they, they basically drew straws to see who was going to get whacked. Especially the oldest member of the crew, Edmund Brooks. He was very much opposed to the idea and reiterated that they were in the shipping lanes and they may spot a ship and be rescued at any moment. A few more days passed. And the oh, and again, if, I, I think I talked over it a bit ago. When they were making the sea anchor to slow them down, it's because they were in the main sea lanes where the, where the, where the commercial ships would sail. And so they, the idea was to keep them there in the shipping lanes so that if a ship did have to pa- happen to pass, they'd be able to see it and uh, hopefully get its attention. Uh, so that's why the guy was, that's why this guy was against eating people after only four days. He's like, "Ah, let's give it a little while longer to see if a ship is coming along to pick us up. To the idea and reiterated that they are in the shipping lanes and they may spot a ship and be rescued at any moment. A few more days passed and the men's desperation and despair increased. Richard Parker seemed to be particularly weak. He spent the days and nights lying in the keel of the boats. And as he did... The talk of one of them being killed and eaten continued. Captain Thomas Dudley and first mate Edwin Stevens thought that this would be the only way they may survive. They both had wives and children and believed that they needed to resort to such measures in order to be able to live through the ordeal until they were spotted by a passing ship. (laughs) Okay, this is where it starts to get a little bit dark. Uh, They they were going to do it democratically. You're do, doing the uh, the luck of the draw. You draw straws, and if you lose, you lose big time. But no, no, no. Everybody's like, ah, let's not be so hasty. They wait a couple more days, waiting for the skinny little orphan person who nobody is going to miss to start to get a little bit weak, a little bit sleepy, a little bit daisy. 
you're getting a little bit dazed. And then they start saying, well, I've got a wife, I've got kids. Uh, you know, we, you, you're the, you're the captain. We've got, uh, we all have a reason to live and a little orphan boy there. He ain't going to be missed. Hmm. I have an idea. <laughs> Rock, paper, steak. <laughs> be able to get bad wives and children and believe that they needed to resort to such measures in order to be able to live through the ordeal until they were spotted by a passing ship and to be able to get passage home on the 24th of July. Hey, Steph's in the chat. Hey, up, everyone. I'm currently on my dinner break at work and it's quite fitting as I'm eating that topic on deck. Here is cannibalism. Absolutely. Uh, well, you're just about to get to the cannibalism part. Mm, I hope you're having a very, very, very rare steak. Uh, and happy birthday to you yesterday. We mentioned it was your birthday. We sent out some birthday wishes to you. Uh, oh, wow. The mic just got possessed by Satan. Now I, now I see it got really hot there. Hang on. I really need to figure out why my mic is doing things on its own accord. There we go. Let's get back to the cannibalism story. Poor young Richard Parker is about to be the former Richard Parker. July. The May. Oh, don't you dare buffer, you Bye. bitch. They both had wives and children and believed that they needed to resort to such measures in order to be able to live through the ordeal until they were spotted by a passing ship and to be able to get passage home. On the 24th of July, the men had become very desperate. Surely they would not survive another day. Captain Thomas Dudley and first mate Edwin Stevens silently signaled to each other that young Richard Parker should be killed. <laughs> They did not believe he would survive. Can, very... you, just, can you just see that? I mean, this poor dude, they're like, oh, we're really hungry. He's like. <laughs> poor bastard. Much longer. And killing him before his natural death would mean that they would be able to drink his blood. The two men approached him. He was drifting in and out of consciousness. Captain Dudley said a short prayer. Edwin Stevens then held the young man's legs. And as Captain Dudley looked down on him, Richard Parker looked up and whispered, what me? Before the captain cut the delirious and defenseless young man's jugular vein with his penknife, making sure... You see me like, what me? Fuck. <laughs> poor, poor kid. That's like the last thing you saw. He's like, what? Oh, it's me? Shit. And then he gets, he gets knifed in the neck. Ugh. Cut the delirious and defenseless young man's jugular vein with his penknife making sure to catch the blood in his chromatic case. All three men then drank the blood and spent the next few days eating his flesh and bones. Surprisingly, first mate Edwin Stevens, who had very much supported the idea of eating a member of the crew, actually ate very little. Five days later, on the 29th of July, a German ship named the Montezuma spotted the small lifeboat bobbing up and down on the waves. The captain instructed his crew to sail towards it Five days, five days after killing poor young Richard Parker and, and snarfing down his, 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 his juicy little bits. Only five days later, they're rescued. Could they have waited five more days? Could they have waited just five more days before they murdered poor young Richard Parker and drank his blood and ate his flesh as if he were Jesus himself. Um, and while you, you gotta wonder, would, would they be thinking that if only we had waited a few more days or just, I mean, it sounded like Richard Parker was on his last leg, so to speak. Uh, they could have just waited another day for him to go you know, instead of going the whole Monty Python route. I'm not dead. I feel happy. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Uh, Casey, new member. Thank you so much for joining the memberships. And statuesque misc. Statuesque miss. 2845, yeah. When trying to pick up bodies to eat, it starts democratically, but never pans out. Unless it's the frying pan. <laughs> Cannibalism. All right, let's get back to the uh, let's get back to the story of the rescue and the trial. Captain Thomas Dudley, first mate Edwin Stevens, and crewman Edmund Brooks were all rescued. 
Ooh, this question is going to be answered. I Captain wonder why Douglas they ever admitted the to it. Days writing an account of how the Mignonette sank and their 24-day ordeal in the lifeboats. On Saturday, the 6th of September, the German ship docked in Falmouth in the English county of Cornwall before continuing its journey to Hamburg. On their arrival back in England, the three men attended the customs house where Captain Thomas Dudley and first mate Edwin Stevens entered statutory statements. These were a requirement of the Merchant Shipping Acts when a vessel had been lost at sea. The men assumed that they were protected by custom of the sea, so did not hold back and told the authorities exactly what had happened to them and all the ghastly details of how they survived by killing and eating the cabin boy. However, this custom was just that, a custom. That's, that's the thing. It, it was not unknown. It was not unheard of that there, and uh, previous to this, which we'll talk about in a bit, previous to there are other famous cases where ship's crew gets stranded, they get shipwrecked, and it, it was a customary practice that you could eat humans and not to survive and not face any criminal punishments. But again, here's the problem. And was not law. The duty it police sergeant law. of the Falmouth Harbour Police was named James Lafferty. And following the statements that were made by Captain Thomas Dudley and first mate Edwin Stevens, he decided that he should question the two men further. The statements were then telegraphed to the Board of Trade and to the Registrar General of Shipping. Meanwhile, Sergeant Lafferty took the knife used to kill Richard Parker, knowing that this may later be used in evidence. The three men were then detained until a decision on what should happen to them came back from London. However, it was a Saturday, and the decision should really come from the Home Office, which was closed for the weekend. The Sergeant decided that he would arrest the men on the charge of murder on the high seas. He obtained the warrants from the Mayor, and the men were all escorted to the police station. Arrangements were then made for them to appear before the magistrates. Two days later, on the morning of Monday, the 8th of September, Captain Dudley still believed that they acted lawfully by the custom of the sea, so was confident that the charges would be dismissed by the magistrates. However, the magistrate was unsure what to do, so sought advice from the Treasury solicitor. The hearing was adjourned, and the men were returned to their cells. By Wednesday, the 10th of September, the case was being discussed by the Home Secretary. Now, this is going to be interesting how they handle this case. Uh, we had to have some legal connection here to the case rather than just morbid curiosity about snacking on some humes. Uh, <laughs> Mr. K said, legal advice, hey, tell Chandler Halderson that. Yeah, you know, it's a old, you know, Chandler Halderson took a, took, he took a little nibble. He had to take a nibble or at least, or at least lick the knife, one of the two. But uh, yeah, the the, uh, the legal the legal proceedings are really, really, really interesting how they handled it. So William Harcourt, after consulting his top legal advisors, it was decided that they would all reappear in court on the 18th of September, but would be granted bail to enable them to spend some time with their families. By now, news of the three shipwrecked men had been reported all over Britain and the Victorian public were very intrigued by their plight. It was not only reported in Britain, the story of the sailors who ate the cabin boy to survive was reported all over the world. And it seemed that public sentiment very much favored Captain Dudley, first mate Edwin Stevens and sailor Edmund Brooks. It was reported that when the three men returned to court on the 18th of September, the brother of the cabin boy, Richard Parker, shook hands with them and did not appear to show them any ill will. Attempts were made to raise money. And how big of a guy is that? You you murdered and ate my brother, but hey, I get it. You know, we're good. How big of a guy is that? Now, Vicky T, the C is never wrong. Don't bring that garbage around here. Wash your mouth out with soap. That's not welcome here. That that kind of talk is not welcome here. <laughs> okay, let's get back to the brother. To pay for the sailors' defense. Public donations were forthcoming, and the lifeboat was put on display. So for a small fee, inquisitive people were able to view the place where the men had spent 24 days and where they had committed their cannibalistic act. 
the case are presented. So we're, we're, we're the crewman all Wisconsin natives. Seriously, I think so. What's, what is wrong with Wisconsin? you got a lot of people that like to murder people and snack on them there. Must be something in the water. Probably salt water. But yeah. All right. Get back to our heroes. How are they going to get out of this legal conundrum they're in? A small fee. Inquisitive people were able to view the place where the men had spent 24 days and where they had committed their cannibalistic act. The case had presented some difficulties as the only witnesses to the alleged crime were Thomas Dudley, Edwin Stevens, and Edwin Brooks. And as for defendants, all had the right to remain silent. The and prosecution, none however, of them did. decided to offer no evidence against Mr. Edwin Brooks and requested that he be discharged. This meant that at the trial, he could now be called as a witness for the prosecution. See, he's grassing. He's flipping. Yeah. We're not going to charge you. Now you can be a witness for us because we're going to let you off the hook. Grass. The trial opened on the 3rd of November, 1884, in the city of Exeter, before Judge Baron Huddleston. Judge Huddleston was aware that there was strong public opinion. I mean, if you had to go up against a judge that looked like that, he doesn't look like he'd be the most kind and generous and lenient of people. He looks like he'd probably eat somebody given half a chance. In favor of the 3rd of November, 1884, in the city of Exeter, before Judge Baron Huddleston. Judge Huddleston was aware that there was strong public opinion in favor of an acquittal, but the Home Secretary, Sir William Harcourt, was very anxious that Thomas Dudley and Edwin Stevens should be found guilty of murder. The prosecution was led by Arthur Charles QC and Arthur J.H. Collins QC led for the defense. Both Thomas Dudley and Edwin Stevens pleaded not guilty. The judge proposed to proceed in a way not used in a British court since 1785, which was by a special verdict. He outlined that the jury would only be presented the facts of the case and would not give an opinion as to whether the defendants were guilty or innocent. That decision would be determined by the judge. The trial would then be adjourned, so an expanded bench of several judges would be able to hear the counsel's arguments at a later date. The most compelling witness was Edmund Brooks. He described the actions of the defendants whilst in the lifeboats. He believed that Richard Parker would have died first, and in killing and eating him, they had managed to save themselves. After the presentation of evidence, the judge gave the jury a binary decision to accept his direction and find the two men guilty of murder or return a special verdict. Without waiting for a decision, the judge produced a special verdict that he had written the night before. He then asked the jury to indicate their approval of the facts as he read them out. He believed that the evidence had established that all of the men would have died if they had not eaten Richard Parker. Parker was very weak and would probably have died first. At the time See, this is this is really, really weird. Yes, that's that's the dog snoring. Uh, if you can hear it. Yeah, that's the dog snoring. Um, yeah, this trial was was really wild. Uh, they didn't really call many witnesses, other than well, I mean, the only witnesses they could call were the people involved. Uh, but it was a directed verdict where they said, you know, either you find you either you agree with me and find him guilty, or you don't. And here's why he's guilty. Do you agree to this? Uh, the idea is, is even the judge was saying that. You know, the guy probably would have, Richard Parker probably would have died. Uh, but the thing is the, is the killing. At the time of the killing, it was established that all of the men would have died if they had not eaten Richard Parker. Parker was very weak and would probably have died first. At the time of the killing, there was no reasonable prospect of being saved and that there was no greater necessity for killing Richard Parker than any of the other three men. As the judge read out these statements, he took the jury's silence as agreement. Finally, yeah. So you read the statements and say, "Do you agree with these?" And the jury sits there quietly, and he says, "Well, okay, you didn't say anything, so therefore you must agree with me." So, okay, here's my verdict. Not the most fair trial ever. The the judge said, "But whether upon the whole matter the prisoners were and are guilty of murder, the jury are ignorant and refer to the courts." The judge then renewed the defendant's bail 
and the case was referred to the Queen's Bench Division for its decision. The Queen's Bench Division sat on the 4th of December and proceedings were presided over by Lord Coleridge with an expanded panel of judges. The defence barrister, Arthur Collins, told them that the killing was done out of necessity. He outlined that his clients had no option but to take another's life in order to increase their own chances of survival. There were very few legal cases for which Mr Collins could refer, but he did cite the 1842 case, United States v Holmes. In this case, the US ship William Brown sank after hitting an iceberg. Crewmen, including Mr Holmes, believed that their lifeboat was overloaded and in danger of sinking so put 14 passengers overboard in the cold water and ultimately to their deaths. In this case, the judge in the Pennsylvania courts instructed the jury that necessity might be a complete defence, but the person who commits the crime claiming necessity must be faultless and owe no duty to the victim. Mr Holmes was convicted, but he only received a very short prison sentence and a $20 fine. At the end of the proceedings, the judges mm. withdrew to consider the verdict. When they returned, Lord Coldridge said that the panel of judges found that there was no defence of necessity to a charge of murder. He questioned how the comparative value of lives should be measured. Was it strength or intellect or something else? He also did not think that it was any more necessary to kill Richard Parker than any of the other three men who were on board the lifeboat, Thomas Dudley and Edwin Stevens were then sentenced to death with a recommendation for mercy. The uh, yeah, so uh, they're in a bit of a conundrum. They thought what they were doing was proper. They thought they had custom on their side. They may have had custom on their side to a certain extent, but then we get down to this. Was it necessary to kill this one person to survive. And that's what they were just talking about. What's the comparative value of the human lives amongst the four on that boat? Is it the oldest that goes first? Is it the weakest that goes first? Is it the stupidest one that goes first? You know, how do you decide? How do you how do you value the life and, and determine which which life is is the least valuable? Uh, oh, and by the way, you murdered him. It may have been necessary to eat him, but it may not have been necessary to murder that specific person at that specific time. They failed to prove it was necessary to murder the guy. Necessary to eat him is one thing. Necessary to murder him and then eat him is a different thing. So they held them guilty of murder and they sentenced they they recommended a sentence of, they they sentenced them to death and recommended mercy. Um Yep. And how goes this? Oh, wait. Hang on. We got to let's clear off these super chats before we get to the finale of this video. We've only got just a, a minute or two left. Eve, Eve Barlow's rotten crotch. They probably just have gone down on each other for protein. I mean, if you're going to go, you should go with an empty sack and a smile on your face. Eve Barlow's rotten crotch. That's so wrong. <laughs> I I tend I tend to agree with that, but thank you for the super chat. <laughs> you degenerate. Uh, uh, what do you got here? Bad weather biker, Wisconsin. Here, I literally I have I live literally 15 miles from Ed Gain's place. Yeah, I forgot about Ed. You got Ed Gain. You've got uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. You've got Halderson, Taylor Shabusiness. Uh, you got you got a lot of a lot of murdery, hungry people there. <laughs> I'm not saying Chandler Halderson or Taylor Should Business took a bite or you know licked their fingers at least, but if they did, that was the least offensive thing that either of them did. Uh, so just saying, Spooky Spoon, thank you so much for the super chat. <laughs> Korari, I thought my cat was going to throw up. Never mind, my cat just threw up. <laughs> Don't know what that was about, but I just like that. Is this what you'd call a water burger over there? Ah, ah see, uh, if if you know what a burger, that's funny. <laughs> All right. Oh, she business did more than take a bite; she took a ride. 
she, she did more than take a ride too. That's uh Oh, by the way, tune in on Wednesday for our Taylor Ship Business update. As long as we're talking about hacky, choppy people in Wisconsin that probably took a nibble or two. Wednesday, Taylor Ship Business and other legal news. Back to the let's get to the grand finale of this video. There was a public outcry, and the general opinion was that the verdict was not just on the advice of the Home Secretary, Sir William Harcourt. Queen Victoria commuted the sentence Good on to you, six Queen. months in prison. Thomas Dudley eventually emigrated to Australia, where he made sails for boats and was known as Cannibal Tom. <laughs> he died in the year 1900. The whole ordeal took its toll on Edwin Stevens. He began to drink heavily and died in poverty in 1914. Although Edmund Brooks was never charged, he made money out of the whole gruesome episode. By appearing in a touring circus, he was known as a cannibal of the high seas and would eat pieces of raw meat thrown at him by the crowd. He died in 1919. In the brilliant book, Life of Pi, published in 2001 and written by author Jan Martel, a young boy is adrift in a lifeboat with a Bengal tiger. The tiger's name is Richard Parker. Oh my God. Oh my God, how did I never notice that? I didn't even notice it when I was watching this the first time. I always stopped the video when you started talking about the life of Pi because I figured it was over. <laughs> That's right. The tiger's name was Richard Parker. I literally, I've watched this thing literally three times. And every single time when he ta starts talking about the book Life of Pi, I turn it off because I go, there's like 20 seconds left. That's the end. They're just going to mention being lost at sea. Oh, my God. The tiger's name was Richard Parker. God damn it. Now I'm going to have to go watch that long ass movie again. All right, you've just watched me watch my brain explode live on on my live stream. Wow. Well, yeah, but the the Edgar Allan Poe book, yeah, you know that's what we were talking about at the beginning. For those of you that are joining us midstream, Edgar Allan Poe wrote a book. He wrote a short story like thirty years before this ship was built, uh, where one of the characters, Richard Parker was eaten by fellow crewmen after they became stranded. Uh, so that was, that was so creepily prophetic, uh, to even get the guy's name right. But I didn't, I, 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 wow. I did not make the connection. I wish I would have kept listening to that, uh, when I, when I was preparing this, but yeah, the tiger in, in, in the life of pie was named Richard Parker. That's way cool. All right. Well, there we go. Uh, huh. Let's see what other things can happen in the last 20 seconds of this video. And written by author Jan Martel, a young boy is adrift in a lifeboat with a Bengal tiger. The tiger's name is Richard Parker. The book was made into a movie in 2012. Hello, everyone. And thank you so much for listening. Well, hey, we may have to look at the horrifying case of beautiful Veronica Gideon. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's that's the story in a nutshell. Hmm. Yeah, that's the that's that's the story of the mignonette. <laughs> Rose, trigger warning, cannibalism. <laughs> If you're triggered by past experiences of cannibalism, you have more problems than my video to worry about. <laughs> wow. Okay, I was actually literally stunned by that Richard Parker Life of Pi thing. I wish I had listened to that last sentence of <laughs> this video. Uh, then I wouldn't have been so surprised. Um but uh, there, there's one other video. So it, it's uh, basically the same thing. The uh, <laughs> D-Way, nice picks. What what picks are we talking about? We're talking about 
you've seen my Godzilla pics. You can't possibly be talking about Godzilla. Uh, but anywho, yeah, the trigger warning is in the title of the video itself. <laughs> oh, all right. Now, th this next video is it's a, on the same subject. There's a lot of overlap. It's six minutes long, uh, which for me, I guess, means it's going to be about four hours. Uh, now it's a it's a six minute video, but it it casts it, it sheds a few more a uh, few more details here. Uh, all right. The, the mic position poll is now officially at an end. We have 405 votes. People like the new position of the microphone better. Uh, I do too, actually, but uh, I need to kind of mic do some micro adjustments. Uh, but 19% 19, 19 of you like the old place and 81% like the new place. So I guess we'll keep it in the new place. Um, I, I, it just feels more open and free here in front of me. More room to wave my, my hands around. Yes, Jeff finally gets it. Six minutes equals four hours. Oh, and the email I get. I don't know why you have to talk so long about these things. You could do it in a much shorter format. I don't know why this needs to be hours and hours and hours. You're just greedy and trying to drag it out so you can grift more for Super Chats. No, I just like to talk. <laughs> That's literally it. I just like spending time with you guys and talking about things. Oh... Uh, now, see, Barney, you were close. Cannibalism on the filet mignonette. Nah, I, it would have been filet on the mignonette if I were to write the book. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, Fondlin, thank you so much for the $10. Deeply. What the hell? Nice picture of uh, it appears to be a moray eel. That's pretty cool. All right. Adriana, die, Jeff. Oh, DJ Jeff. And they said, die, Jeff. I was like, well, that's that's pretty harsh. Yeah, you're, <laughs> the, sh the shore microphone is upside down. Uh, I can't not see it. Oh, I know, because like I said, this, this was literally changed 15 seconds before I came on the air. So the, the shore microphone will write itself for tomorrow. Uh, if you're that distracted. Uh, ah, there. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You're just going to have to live with it. There. Now you can't tell if the S is upside down or not. <laughs> All right. We'll we'll make sure it's in the right position tomorrow. All right. Here we go. No, we're not done yet, Tina. We got another cannibal story. It's the same story, but uh, a few more a few more details are are brought into play on this video. Uh, that, that's why I wanted to, uh, re, re, despite the redundancies. Oh, Mr. Upper Torso, thank you for the super chat. My gosh, people are so rude. Here, take my money instead. You can grift me any day. Hey, grift, grift, grift. Super chat, super chat, super chat. There we go. Uh, got that out of the way. Dude, Friday was a good day. We don't have to. We don't have to super chat much. Uh, just my usual mid, middle, mid, and, and you know, my middle beginning of the stream and midstream. That's kind of it. Uh. All right, but I do I do grift for likes. Likes are are, are easy and free to do. Uh, oh, Casey, before we get to the other six minute video, this is something interesting. Uh, is people ask is Nick streaming today? Does anyone know? I don't know if he's going to be streaming at night, but at one p.m. Central, he will be on Alex Jones's Infowars. So. Yeah, Nick Ricada will be on Alex Jones's show. At, I believe it's 1 p.m. Central. I'm sure if you go to his locals, he'll have all the details there. Uh, so what part of the human body do you think is the best? Well, Casey, shame on you for asking that question. Oh, do you have a little bulldog too? Is that a bulldog? I can't see. Oh, let's bulldoggy. Uh, which part of the human body do you think is best? It would have to be a fatty part of the body, uh, you know, like a, like a like a white meat part of the body. Huh. I would probably go with like under the arm, like with like the triceps, because that that would seem to have like a good mix of, of of meat and fat. Thighs, the back of the thighs, more than the front of the thighs. People were saying. Uh, oh, see, this is the thing, Jeff. That was a warning. You will die. We're going to cannibalize you. I'm dead. I don't give a shit. Just don't make me dead so you can eat me. <laughs> I would probably object to that. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. 
So I, I would guess either like the triceps or the, or, or, or the uh, like somewhere around the hamstring, like the back of the thighs uh, or the foot. The foot might be a nice little kind of, you know, like depending if they're like healthy or fat. If they're fat, then like the calves maybe. Why am I talking about this? Uh, now the butt cheeks would be like way too muscly. That'd just be like eating shoe leather probably. I mean, it might make a good stew, but yeah. <laughs> Crazy cat queen. If I'm ever on the high seas and we're starving, I'm cutting off my leg and serving calf tenderloin, partial steak tartare, so we all survive. Well, there's actually a very, very interesting story, a short story written by Stephen King. Uh, I believe it was in his book Night Shift or one of the other one of his other books. Uh, where about this doctor, I think four before midnight, I can't, it was in one of his short story collections. A doctor is on a ship, he crashes, he, he, he gets shipwrecked on this ocean, and apparently there was some heroin or something on the uh, on the ship with him, and that's the only thing he's got, is like himself and a bag of heroin. Uh, he tries to catch fish, doesn't work, he tries to catch some seagulls, it doesn't work, he throws a, he throws a rock and breaks a seagull's wing, and while he's scrambling across the rocks to get to the seagull, he breaks his ankle, and then he's screwed, he can't catch, he can't catch birds or fish anymore, it's starting to rot, so he decides to start taking some of the heroin and carving off pieces of his body uh, for a nourishment, because he's a surgeon, he knows how to do this, and he basically like just goes through his legs, uh, and the short story is so cool, because as the doctor is going along and describing which parts he's eating, he's also becoming a massive heroin addict. <laughs> <laughs> and so the writing is becoming, it's his, it's his diary entry. So the writing is becoming more and more erratic. And then finally he has to uh, go for his writing fingers and the journal ends. Uh, it's a great short story. I, that's one of my favorite Stephen King short stories because I'm sick. <laughs> Baloney bong again, disregards emails, remain high, high seas grifter. I, I don't ignore the emails. I really don't. I read them all and then I kind of forget to go. The ones, that, okay, email. Uh, <laughs> the ones that suggest things for Maritime Monday, they get read and put like in a list. Uh, the ones that ask me questions, I usually try to answer them. Uh, but I usually look at my email about once a week because uh, I'm just, Super, super, super busy. I don't disregard your emails. I would never do that. I just forget to answer some of them. <laughs> now I'm guilted into going back. I'll, I'll look at the email tomorrow. Uh, it was too busy this weekend, but I'll go look at it. Uh, Cicada Mania, thank you so much for the super chat. Bourdain said the cheeks would be, yeah, well, the, uh, but there's not a lot of meat there. But the, I mean, the cheeks of anything are good. If you get like fish cheeks and things, oh my God, like pork jowls. Mm, yeah, good, good point. The cheeks would be the best. They're small. I was thinking like quantity over quality, I guess. Long pig belly. Yeah, long long pork belly. I got way too much fat. I, you could just sort of use me to grease the pan. <laughs> uh, all right. Have we, have we caught up on the super chat? Wow, I sound like Alex Jones there. We caught up on the super chats. Let's go. <clears throat> uh, let's watch this last, this last version of the story, and uh, then we'll call it an early night. We're doing pretty good today. And I'm trying like, while the Brooks trial is going on because I, you know, I expect Nick to, uh, to be calling me and I really do need to get some sleep. So I'm thinking about just kind of keeping it around one hour, one and a half hours while this Brooks trial is going on. Uh, so tonight's kind of a dry run. Here we go. The story of the minionette, the six minute and 20 second version. This, the, it is more about the aftermath. What happens after? Frank and Beans. <laughs> On July 5th, 1884, a small yacht carrying four crewmen got caught in a storm off the Cape of Good Hope and sank in just five minutes. The men only managed to grab a few tins of turnips before the ship sank, but no fresh water. In the following weeks, they floated aimlessly in a flimsy lifeboat hundreds of miles from land. When the 17-year-old mm -hmm. cabin boy lost consciousness, the captain killed him so the men could eat his flesh to survive. Nom, nom, nom. Just a few days later, they were rescued. Today, we explore the story of the mignonette and the gruesome murder that sparked a landmark case involving survival cannibalism. Built in 1867, the mignonette was a 52-foot yacht designed for coastal sailing. 
but when an Australian lawyer visiting England bought the boat in 1883, he wanted it delivered to his home in Australia. This, of course... Okay, real quick here. Uh, Rose and others are saying you need to stream the trial today. Don't kill me. Uh, today in America is Columbus Day, so the court is not in session. There is no court hearing today. So, yeah, no trial today. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> Back to the story. Suppose the challenge. As Australia was thousands of miles away and the mignonette was not designed for such an arduous journey. Nevertheless, the wealthy lawyer was determined to get his yacht, and he managed to find someone foolhardy enough to take on the challenge for a reasonable fee, 31-year-old Captain Tom Dudley. And so, on May 19, 1884, the mignonette set off on the 15,000-mile journey from Southampton, England, to Sydney, Australia. Captain Dudley's crew consisted of 37-year-old <laughs> Edwin Stevens, 39-year-old Edmund Brooks, hey, and an orphaned 17-year-old cabin boy by the name of Richard Parker. On July 5th, the Mignonette hit a gale about 1,500 miles northwest of the Cape of Good Hope. As the young cabin boy went below decks to make the crew tea before bedtime, a wave struck the boat and washed away the bulwark. Realizing the ship was doomed, they all jumped into a 13-foot wooden dinghy with just enough time for Dudley to grab the compass and a few tins of turnips before the ship went down. Stranded hundreds of miles from the nearest land with no fresh water, the situation quickly grew dire. They managed to catch a sea turtle at one point, which offered them momentary respite from hunger, but with no water, the men continued to suffer from severe dehydration. After failing to catch any rainwater, they eventually resorted to drinking their own urine. Presumably mad with thirst, the 17-year-old cabin boy, Richard Parker, turned to drinking seawater as a final resort. This, of course, made him violently ill and put him on the brink of a coma. According to later testimony, hmm. there had been discussion among the men about a sacrificial killing, but the topic was dropped. A sacrificial killing makes it sound so religious. I need to move this back down. Sorry, you'll just have to put up with the backwards sure sign. Um, yeah, uh, people are saying there is court in Wisconsin and checking out law and crime. They seem to think that there is a trial today as well. Huh. Well, you don't say. Hmm. Let me think about it <laughs> for a few minutes here. Wait, you need to push stop, push play. But now that the young cabin boy seemed to be on the brink of death anyway, it presented the perfect opportunity to kill and eat him for the sake of the group. Captain Dudley rationalized killing him by explaining that he and Stevens had wives and families to live for. Parker was just an orphan. Around July 25th, the decision was made. Parker would have to die if the others were to live. Dudley signaled to Stevens to hold Parker's legs if he struggled. After a quick prayer, Dudley drove his penknife into Parker's jugular and killed him. The three men drank Parker's blood and fed on his body over the next few days. Presumably overcome with guilt, Stevens ate very little of Parker. Mm -hmm. Dudley later described the gruesome scene. Does it matter how much you eat when you're being a cannibal? In during the trial, saying, I can assure you I shall never forget the sight of my two unfortunate companions over that ghastly meal. On July 29th, the three survivors were rescued by a German sailing ship. They insisted on taking Parker's remains to England for a proper burial. Once ashore in Falmouth, England, all three men assumed Parker's killing was justified and that they would be protected by the custom at sea. This custom basically mm. dictated that shipwrecked survivors could sacrifice someone through a random selection process called drawing lots, which meant drawing straws, sticks, or pebbles, or whatever object might be available after a shipwreck, and whoever got the shortest straw or stick would be the unfortunate chosen one. As the three men told customs officials about murdering and eating the young boy, a police officer named Laverty overheard them and told his friends down at the station. This selection process, thought Laverty, didn't sound so random. As a result, the men were arrested for murder on the high seas. The public was surprisingly forgiving. Being in a coastal city, the townspeople were accustomed to losing loved ones to the sea. And so, they were sympathetic <clears throat> to the situation that three men found themselves in. Perhaps most surprising, the victim's brother even showed forgiveness by shaking the men's hands in court. 
The court, on the other hand, was not so forgiving. Authorities at the time were worried about the custom of the sea and the dangerous precedent it set for unpunished murders. And so it was decided that Dudley and Stevens must be punished to set an example. Indeed, no law stated that necessity, in their case, starvation, was a defense for taking young Richard Parker's life. Dudley and Stevens were convicted of murder and sentenced to be executed. The other sailor, Edmund Brooks, was discharged hmm, as it was Brooks? determined he had always been against killing Parker. Brooks was so, a murder? Hmm. It was he and Dudley who ate most of Parker. In the end, due to a lack of evidence and what was described by one historian as a complete mess of a court case, their sentence was commuted to just six months. Thomas Dudley would go down in history as the cannibal captain, which was the headline used to announce his death from bubonic plague in 1900. While Dudley and Stevens only served a minimal sentence for killing and eating someone, the case is still discussed as an example of necessity as a defense and whether murder is ever justified for survival. So what do you think <clears throat> of this case? Does taking one's life justify saving three others? Hmm. What would you have done in this situation? Thank you for watching today's video. If you enjoy stories about ships and maritime history, please consider subscribing to be notified when I post a new video. Your feedback and support are greatly appreciated. Okay, that's that is the end of that. Um, yeah, okay, we we see that the uh, we see that the trial is being held today. Apparently, in Wisconsin, they don't care about uh, don't care about Christopher Columbus. <laughs> um, all right, yeah, that's definitely got to be moved. So. Do you want me to do it? I can do probably the morning session. I can't do the entire thing. I do need sleep. I could probably do the morning session until the lunch break. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can do that if we want it. Uh, stream it. Yes, 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 yes. Do it, do it, do it, do it. Okay. Well, let me wrap this up. Then I'll go set up another stream, and uh, then we'll, we'll get right onto it. Uh, so, all right. I got a few super chats here to get through. Uh, by the way, do you guys like, uh, was this an interesting topic? Do we like this? Because I was thinking about doing another cannibal on the high seas case next week. Do we want more, want more cannibalism? Do you want, if you want more cannibalism, let me know and we'll do more cannibalism next week. All right, yes, we love cannibalism on this channel, of course. Okay, so next week, as Fondlin said, ask a mortician, she did a really good video on the real story of Moby Dick. The real story of Moby Dick is a horror story of cannibalism. Uh, so I was actually going to uh, do that next week. I was going to do Ask a Mortician's uh, Moby Dick video next week. So let's do that. More cannibalism coming at you next week. Steve, thank you so much. Your grift is weak today. There is court in Wisconsin today, with the exception of one county. Uh, yep, we'll be there. They're starting live in one minute, so I got to wrap this up, and then it'll take me about five minutes to get ready. But hang around for the channel. The notification will go out. Uh, just you know, keep refreshing uh, about four minutes from now, uh, four minutes from the time we end, and it'll be there. Um, Thank you so much for the super chat. I love King now. I tried to read Night Shift freshman year in college. Couldn't pat get couldn't get past boogeyman made my roommate keep the nightlight on and the closet doors open at night because it freaked me out so much i like his stories purple aj thank you so much nick just posted locals that he can't do the trial yeah well we, i when i was talking to him about it, he's like no it's columbus day there's no I'm, oh yeah i forgot it was columbus day uh but apparently nobody cares about columbus day in wisconsin so we're gonna go do that uh make sure i got everything here hey everybody that's like gonna be the end of maritime monday today uh join us next week when we do it again for more cannibals uh tomorrow alec baldwin settlement and other issues uh settlement and other lawsuits on wednesday we'll be talking taylor's business and other legal news thursday uh is we're gonna get back to oj simpson and the cross-examination of mark Furman. friday friday there's a 90 percent chance i won't be here because legal mindset and i will be down the beach from my house probably getting liquored up beyond any reasonable amount uh but uh, we might pop on and do a quick uh, little a quick little live stream from whatever dive bar we happen to find ourselves in. Uh, we'll check in one way or the other. But regardless of whether there's a Friday stream, there will be pictures. Uh, <laughs> we'll make some pictures and videos. So, all right. 
everybody, I'm going to cut this short. Thank you so much, mods, for being here. Thank you so much. You were all a huge support today. Thank you so much for all of you, that, that all the new people that came today, all the old people that came today. Hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button on your way out if you haven't. If you have, double check to make sure you're still subscribed. I love all of you guys, and I will see you in five minutes on a completely separate stream. I'm out of here, and until I see... I was looking at my watch, and I don't have a watch. Uh, until I see you five minutes from now, don't forget to enjoy your legal vices. <laughs> Bye.